Good evening and welcome to City of Pasco Council Workshop Meeting. The Council thanks you for being part of your city government. At workshop meetings, the Council discusses issues but no formal, formal action is taken. Agenda packets are available on the Pasco, City of Pasco's website at wwwpasco agenda. This meeting is being televised live on PSC TV Channel 191 on Spectrum Cable in Pasco and Richland and is streamed in the city face city's Facebook page, website, YouTube channel, and go to webinar. This and previous council meeting video is available on the city's website. Lastly, the public may submit their comments and or questions by contacting city manager, city clerk, or the Ask Pasco app. And with that, can I get roll call, please? Council members Brown. Present. Campos. Present. No. Present. Roach. Present. Serrano. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Maloney. Present. And Mayor Barajas. Present. And would you please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again, everyone. Um, happy St. Valentine's Day Eve or something. <laughs> Thank you everyone for the treats in front of us and um, cherish your loved ones. All right, with that, we will go on into our agenda. First item on the agenda is the um, verbal reports from council members. Any council members attended any meetings uh, that they wish to share? going to be a quick meeting so moving on to our next item on the agenda items for discussion first item on the agenda is housing authority interlocal agreement uh, director white thank you madam mayor and council and matt truman the executive director from the pasco franklin county housing Authority, is here to give council um, a brief update on the housing authority and uh, discuss the interlocal agreement between the city and the authority thank you If you'll press the button to turn on red. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you. I'm Matt Truman. I'm the executive director for the Housing Authority of the City of Pasco and Franklin County. We're an independent agency uh, from the city and the county. And I think a better way uh, that I introduce myself to most of the people in the community is I say, we're an agency or the housing authority for the City of Pasco and Franklin County. That's really our mission is to serve the people both in the city and the county. Our mission is to provide safe, clean, and affordable housing and to help build strong communities here in our area. I attached a short About Us paper as part of this introduction just to kind of give you a few facts um, about our agency. Uh, we manage over 348 housing units. We serve over 700 children. Um, we serve over 421 elderly or disabled residents. Um, in all, we help provide housing to more than 725 families in our community. The programs we provide are all public housing, affordable housing, tax credit housing. We run a housing choice voucher program, which is commonly known as the Section 8 program. And we also have a family self-sufficiency program, which helps residents um, move out of public or affordable housing and become homeowners themselves or use that money towards education to better their lives and to, to move on from public assistance. Um, as a the housing authority, um, the need for, we know there's a, a great need for more housing in our community, and in my opinion, that's a good problem to have, and much better than the alternative. I know the people of this city and the county will find a path forward on this issue. I was proud to participate in a panel with the City of Pasco for the Housing Solutions Lab, and I commend both Jacob Gonzalez, the planning manager, and Kristen Webb, the community block grant coordinator, for all their hard work on this panel to help increase the housing needs in this community. For us, partnerships are the key to, to the mission of our housing authority. Like I said earlier, we provide housing for more than 725 families in this community. But just getting them keys and into housing is often not enough. We know that some of these residents face a host of other obstacles. To prevent homelessness, our agency must work hand in hand 
with other agencies to keep them in their housing. This includes making sure that their mental, physical, and other needs are sometimes being met. We do not provide housing to homeless uh, people at this time. Our main population that we serve is to low and extremely low income families that are experiencing barriers to obtaining housing due to income or other past issues. We work with community partners each day to provide housing for veterans, domestic violence victims, elderly and disabled, and families that are on the verge of losing their housing. This year, we're hoping to add more to this list by being able to help those that are aging out of foster care between the ages of 18 and 23 to help them find stable housing uh, in this process. We formed great relationships and partnerships with many agencies in this community. We appreciate the Pasco PD, for example, for all their support in helping to establish a block watch program for our residents and for all that they've done to support us in our mission and with our youth. However, up until recently, we've had a very limited working relationship with the city of Pasco itself. Uh, prior to my time as executive director, it had been a, a weary relationship, to be honest, between our two organizations. This was due to a dispute back going back into the early 2000s in which the uh, in which a Pasco city manager unsuccessfully tried to eliminate the housing authority twice and lost in court. It was a terrible waste of money, resources, and time. And to be honest, I think it was a waste of opportunity between our two great organizations. The after effects that there was little to no communication between our agency for many years. Um, in 2014, the housing authority built our first tax credit project called Varney Court. This is located over on 13. 318 Pearl Street. This provided much needed affordable workforce housing for residents here in Pasco. Unexpectedly, near the end of the project, the City of Pasco required our agency to pay a pilot tax on this property. Pilot stands for payment in lieu of taxes. I say unexpectedly because currently the City of Pasco is the only city in Washington to place a pilot tax on an affordable housing project. Although we are tax exempt, the Housing Authority agreed to this tax so we could complete the project which had already started and avoid further straining our relationship with the city. Today, I don't feel this is the same relationship that was there in the past. Various city employees have reached out and been very supportive of our mission and our agency. And anything, I should probably apologize more to the city of Pasco for not reaching out ourselves as an agency to work with the city of Pasco. This is something I would like to change. I feel confident today that both our organizations can work together on common goals. The reason this issue of removing the pilot tax is so important to our housing agency is because the Varney Court project had multiple phases. The housing authority owns more land next to this complex, which was designated for a phase two. We are currently in the process of exploring the option of building again. But before we can move forward, we are requesting from the city of Pasco to just consider removing the current pilot tax from our affordable housing project. The current pilot tax is about $2,000 a month. Um, the tax, a tax credit project requires a partnership between a housing authority and a private partner. Participation in a tax credit program enables developers, such as us, the housing authority, to access much needed capital from investors in exchange for delivery of tax credits generated at a residential building level for the investors. Applying for tax credit dollars and projects can be competitive. To attract these private investors, we need to show the local community is invested in affordable housing. However, being the only city in Washington to impose a pilot tax on affordable housing, the message is unfortunately that we are not as competitive as we could be. I have already had discussions on this proposal with both the city planning manager and the community and economic development director, Rick White. I appreciate them taking the time to listen about this issue. It was their suggestion that I bring this to your attention since it would require your approval to remove this pilot. A short legal agreement has already been submitted to the city to review and to sign to remove the pilot if you choose to do so. By removing the pilot tax, the city would help us attract more investors if we decide to move forward with phase two and if we decide to build more tax credit properties in the city of Pasco and the county, uh, Franklin County. It would also allow us to use those monies to reinvest in affordable housing and services for our tenants. We're only asking the city of Pasco to treat this issue like other cities in the state of Washington and to consider removing this pilot tax. 
The city of Pasco has done great things in the past few years in making housing more available for residents. I want to continue to build our partnership with the city of Pasco and find sensible, compassionate, and also economic ways to serve our low income and working families. The second handout I provided was just some examples of ways we can work together in other areas. I was part of the Pasco community for more than 10 years. I have family that lives in the city of Pasco in the Franklin County, and I really love this city and this area, and I've invested in it to see it grow in all its different ways. Like I said earlier, our mission cannot be completed without your help, without strong partnerships with the community and with local partners. If you'd like me a deeper dive into this issue or how we operate or what programs we provide, I would be happy to present again in whatever meeting you suggest. Uh, thank you for your time and your service to the city of Pasco. Thank you for your presentation. Yep. Do we have any questions, comments? Councilman <laughs> and then Councilman Serrano. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Mr. Truman, if I could ask, while we've got your time, yeah. you know, we as a council have discussed at length opportunities to address our homelessness issue we've got in Pasco and, and single room occupancy housing has come up several several times. I know you're not proposing that tonight, but I just want to know if I could ask you what your honest opinion is and if you'd be in support of something like that, if that would also contribute to the housing issue. I think got. it would be a tremendous um, uh, help to the housing issue. Uh, right now, for example, we know we have a, about a 1% vacancy rate in all of the Tri-Cities and especially in Pasco, it's even it's even more. I have more than 400 families on a waiting list. Um, I can tell you that in HUD terms or in housing agency terms, we have a success rate of less than 20%, which means if I give out 20 vouchers to people to find housing, less than 5%, 5% or less, will find somewhere to rent in the Tri-Cities right now. Um, we know that this is an issue um, that uh, is, is needed in this community. Um, I think there's lots of ways that we can provide for that. Uh, one and two bedroom apartments are what is most needed. When we open up our wait list, probably 80% of our needs are for one and two bedroom housing, especially for those that are most vulnerable, elderly, disabled, uh, and so on. And so, yeah, um, as an agency, our main focus is to keep people in their housing and to keep them from being homeless in the first place. We do that by helping them find money for utilities, helping them find mental health services, making sure that they're healthy uh, physically, you know, other things. Uh, like I said, uh, our goal is to keep them in their housing and off the streets. Thank you. Councilman Serrano. Thank you. Uh, just to make sure I understand, I've, I've got a, kind of a two-parted question, then a follow-up, I believe. <clears throat> Tonight's presentation was the one, introduce yourself, and then two, address re revocation of the pilot program. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I'd just like the city of Paso to consider removing the pilot tax. Um, uh, it's a complex, you know, it's, it's a bigger issue that I can come back and present in more detail um, exactly what a tax credit program housing is, how that works. Um, but the gist of it is, is to do it, we need investors to, to invest with us. And to do that, they look at everything and when they see something as unusual as a pilot tax on an affordable housing project, it makes them a little weary. And so that's why we'd like to, and we feel that we could use that money to reinvest to help our tenants and people in the community by providing more services for them. I appreciate that. And then just reading through the contract from 2014, are those numbers still accurate, meaning that 92.43 and change is the total Cumulative annualized pilot tax between the several jurisdictions, is that correct? $92,000? Nine, $9,243.76. No, right now it's currently between, I think, twenty two to 24000 a year. I think I'd have to be able to give you that exact number, um, but I can I can find that. Yeah. So, okay, that, that'd be helpful because yeah. I see the contractual amount being, you know, so I'm just going to run the four. Mm -hmm. City of Pasco, $1,732.00. Pasco School District with the lion's share at six thousand, almost sixty dollars. Mm -hmm. Port of Pasco two hundred eighty-six dollars, and Franklin County at uh, eleven sixty, one thousand one hundred sixty-five dollars. So, I think fundamentally the question for me is, have you presented this one to the Pasco School District report and the county 
Two, if not, what is your intention there? Mm-hmm. And then three, uh, realizing we're kind of right in the middle of that. And quite frankly, we're less than a fifth of what Pasco School District is. What is your intention with having them pull that back? You know, obviously, if we pull back 8% or whatever our number is mm-hmm. of 22 grand, you're going to see $1,600, $1,800. Well, we've already had discussions with the county on this issue. In fact, a couple of years ago, the county came to us and and asked about the tax on that property. Um, we told them, well, we were already getting taxed by the city of Pasco, so we can't be double taxed on that. Um, so the, the county actually worked with us to ensure our tax exempt status so that they would not tax us anymore on that. Um, we worked with them to provide that certificate and so on. And so we've already settled the issue with the, the county of Franklin. They consider us tax exempt and would not, uh, would not charge us for that. Um, as far as the, the Pasco uh, schools and stuff like that, um, we haven't talked to them about that yet. We do have a really good working relationship with them, and that's something we'd have to bring up with them. Okay, I, I appreciate mm-hmm. that, and yeah. I see the, the value in, yeah. in um, making these funds available. That said, uh, my interest would not be in you coming immediately back to present. What I would be most interested in is having some type of rolling dialogue through email or something of that nature, letting us know where the status is. You know, we've reached out to, again, primarily the school district because they bear such a lion's share of this. Again, it, in, or, and presenting us with what the current rate is. I mean, all that factual And, and that's what I can do. I just didn't want to drown yeah. the council in facts at the first meeting. Absolutely. But, uh, can, I, I appreciate uh, that. It'd just yeah. be helpful to really yeah. see what the current yeah. status and is I, in the future. I can provide you multiple papers and, and, and stuff like that, and I'd be happy to do it because I think it would show that uh, this would be good for both of us. Yeah, no, I, I, mm-hmm. I don't think there's a, yeah. any disagreement here, yeah. just understanding so, the current status and yeah, I will snippet up. emails, perfect. Yeah, I will follow up with, with something for all the council to consider. Thank you, appreciate it. that. Mayor Pertemaloni. Thank you. Um, of similar mind, I'd sent a similar question over to uh, Director White um, over this weekend for asking the same thing as has this been con- discussed, and I got the, basically the same answer. It's premature if the council is not interested in even entertaining it, um, then why even have a conversation with the entities that don't have any control? Um, so um, so I- I'm interested in the same question, mm-hmm. um, but um, I'm very supportive. This, this seems absolutely bizarre, and I would be really interested in understanding the source. Obviously, none of us here were on council at that time, and it is just a strange thing to take an organization that is providing low-income services um, using tax dollars and tax funds to do a public service, and then for us to come in and, and add in this payment in lieu of taxes on top of this. And, this is sa- and that's usually the reaction I've gotten from almost everybody I've talked to in the city, and I wasn't there at that time either. Um, I just know the past history of the strained relationship between the city and the housing authority. Um, however, moving forward, I've, I've just seen nothing but good things from the city of Pasco and nothing but positive um, reactions from them and so on. But like you said, it is, it is very strange. And like I said, I, you know, I don't want to belabor the point that the city of Pasco you know, has done this. But uh, you know, I just want, like I said, my, my goal here is just to get you to consider I appreciate that. Um, I'm I am favorable of the concept if uh, none of the partner agencies are mm-hmm. squawking about it, because um, honestly, even at an even at the escalated amount based on you know, the adjustments I um, and determined in item four of based on property value, even that I mean, a couple thousand bucks for the city of Pasco really just isn't meaningful in our budget one way or the other, and for such a strange uh, way to affect a partner is is by itself worth it for me to um, want to be in favor of uh, removing that. Um, I did have one qu- qu- clarifying question I wanted to ask about the single residency occupancy units that mm-hmm. um, my fellow council member mm-hmm. asked earlier. Um, and specifically, um, were you referring to private SROs or were you talking about HUD uh, the definition of SROs, which was, I believe, the foundation for where the SROs started was agencies like your own right. buying a motel and converting it to units there as are, opposed to a private. Yeah, there are um, programs more like that. I can tell you that HUD really isn't interested in building public housing units anymore. In fact, they're kind of going the other way, where they would like to see us either renovate, rehabilitate, or modernize the public housing units we have, which is probably going to be a discussion I'm going to have with you again over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, We do have a large public housing stock that needs to be renovated, rehabilitated, or turned over to project based voucher units is what they like to see. So for example, we would buy a unit and it may have eight 
room, you know, eight different apartment units, instead of making it public housing, it would become a project-based voucher where they would use Section 8 vouchers in those units, and we would partner with organizations and so on. And when you were referring to the answer you provided earlier for um, Council Member Compost, yes. were you referring to private or were you referring to public? We can do both, and that's, um, okay. you know, it, it, it depends. There's multiple programs we can use to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, for example, uh, the Housing Authority of the City of Kennewick, uh, for example, is building some units over on Gum Street, you know, with an, in, with, you know, hand in hand with the city of Kennewick to provide housing that they will, they will run and take over just like we run our Barney Court program. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we're going through a housing impact analysis. I think there's a whole study that, that, that I'm sure that you've been made aware mm -hmm. of. Um, and I'll be very interested to hear your thoughts as part of that, that whole, yeah. whole thing. So and, and look like forward said, to that in the future when we, when mm -hmm. we have a, a chance for that to develop out further. Um, the other thing I noticed is I, I looked on your website at the map of the geograph of the housing units that you currently run. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that they're all concentrated in geographic region. Um, everything I've read says that's a terrible idea for right. a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about what's next and how you plan on distributing the, um, the these units more across our city instead of just in one area? A lot of that depends on what's available. Um, really, the golden question is how much land can we find? And then on top of that, what can we, where can we find that land? To be honest, it would be great to build um, over in West Pasco and to provide opportunities over there for these families, uh, for these low and extremely low income families. I think what you really want to see, and I think the most successful program, is where you have mixed housing units. That's what I'd be most interested in doing. A mixed housing unit is where you have people of different economic uh, groups living in the same building. Um, I think that's, that's shown to provide a, a better path forward for people to, to, to leave public housing or to leave any kind of affordable government assistance. Um, and so I would be more interested in, in looking at mixed housing properties that we could uh, provide in other parts of either the county or the city. I appreciate that. All right, well, I, I guess I, I will very much look forward to, uh, I, um, assuming you'll have uh, good input into our housing action yeah, plan. Yeah, I, I have, lots of, I, I have lots of ideas. Can't say you're going to accept all of them, but I have lots of ideas for the council. Well, I certainly think that given this, the state's um, current um, legislative <laughs> actions that are going on mm -hmm. suggest that the state is paying very strong attention. There um, is, and there's a lot of yeah. money, Senator Murray's office, um, there's a lot of things coming out of the state right now. There's a lot of dollars available to request. Um, however, to request those dollars, you have to have a fertile place to, to place them. Um, the last thing you do is want to request dollars and have to give them back. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? No? Not this time. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for your time. We look forward to those communications, mm -hmm. um, and that way we have the opportunity yeah. to have more information. Yeah. And thank you for your questions. And if anybody, my email's on our website and whatever else, anybody wants to email me personally, uh, have me come meet with them, um, I can answer any questions you need. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you very much. With that, we will go on to our next item on the agenda. Um, presentation, Processors Wastewater Treatment Agreement, Director Wordley. Is Miss Sarah not here today? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I know, this is shocking. No, I'm on my own. I feel, you know, like I'm incapable. Oh, you're, you're an expert. We look forward to hearing. <laughs> uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Uh, tonight we are bringing before you the uh, first time that you have seen it, the Processor Wastewater Treatment Agreement. Council may recall that uh, just last Friday we did the public hearing on the Burnham Wastewater Treatment Agreement and I'll refer to it as WTA from now on, okay, just to shorten the meeting as much as we can. And so um, the, uh, this is tonight is for the one for the processors. So initially the development of this WTA was based on the Burnham WTA because the intent was to try to take some of the responsibilities of the city in the Burnham agreement and transfer those over to the processors so that they're meeting the same conditions we're required to meet. So that was the intent of the original agreement. Um, the first draft was reviewed by the processors. We issued a first draft and four processors commented on it. 
We revised the agreement based on the comments and then sent it off to legal for review. Uh, that second draft, which is the one that you're seeing tonight, uh, was sent to the processors on January 31st and asked for comments and haven't received any yet, but I think the processors are working on those and reviewing those with their, their organizations. Uh, I do still see that there are some edits and minor corrections that still need to be made within the document, so uh, don't worry about those. We'll certainly get those cleaned up as we get towards finalization. The biggest concern with this agreement as I have mentioned at the last few meetings, is the total cost of the project. Uh, as you can see in the information that was included in the council packet, there was a very detailed uh, concerted effort to put together a rate model for how to distribute fairly the costs of all of the projects. Now this, this Agreement focuses on the phase three project. Phase one is currently under construction. Phase two are the winter storage ponds. This is phase three and phase four is the upgrade of the irrigation system out to each of the farm circles. So the, the rate model that the FCS group put together for us is very detailed in terms of specifics of each processor, the levels of constituents the, in, in their wastewater, the flow amounts, everything else. So um, we sent that out to the processors back on November 29th. And interestingly enough, that was the first time the processor got to see all of the costs associated with all of the different phases and with all of the existing debt and the previous projects that have already been completed, like the IPS and some of the other ones. And so it was a bit of a shock to see it all at once. We've, we've been giving them information pieces by piece, piece by piece, and Individually, things look fine, but then when you add them all together, it gets pretty, uh, a lot of money. Um, so since that time, the group, and I say the group, meaning the processors, FCS, Burnham, the city, have evaluated six different potential scenarios looking for ways to reduce the cost of the overall system. We've, and uh, the, the team has looked at it, the processors have looked at it, and each time we come back, because of the credits that we're getting both from the RNG revenue and from the investment tax credit on the RNG, the renewable natural gas, the proposal we have before us is, is the best proposal so far. We are still looking at other options. Um, and I don't know that we'll ever stop, but one of the options we're looking at is whether we could withdraw groundwater from areas that have lower nitrogen than what we have currently at some of our uh, pivots. That's one option. And then we're also looking at the potential to partner with local growers to potentially take some of the reuse water from the reuse facility. So it wouldn't just be put on the city's circles, but the idea is to pursue possibly putting it on other people's circles. There's just concerns about our ability to control the crops that are grown and how much nitrogen gets uptake by those crops. So there are issues that would have to be worked out about that, but we are still looking. You will see in the packet there's uh, numerous emails and memos, and the whole point of that was just to show how extensive the communication effort has been and how transparent we all have been, the whole team, on looking at this agreement, looking at the project, looking at the alternatives. So with that, I just want to mention again that the staff and the team are still pursuing grants and potentially low interest loans to reduce the overall cost of the project. Uh, right now, just last week, uh, the Congressional Directed Spending Announcement came out for Senator Murray's office. So we have been in contact with her staff and are looking to pursue funding for this project through that effort. Uh, we are also reached out to the Washington DC contact for the federal uh, USDA, uh, Department of Agriculture. They seem to very much be in favor of this project and are looking for opportunities for us to provide additional funding to make this project successful. And then we also have the request into the state legislature right now uh, to try to get additional funding for this project. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, much of what you see tonight is not a whole lot 
different than what we saw last week in the Burnham Agreement, but obviously different because it's now the processors rather than Burnham themselves. Okay, thank you. Question from uh, Councilman Campos. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Director Worley. Uh, again, congratulations and thank you for all the hard work you put into this. Um, you know, that $5 million grant that we got a couple weeks ago. You loan. Know, loan. Loan, sorry. Um, you know, stuff like that. It just applaud your efforts to continue to go out and look at things that are out there, which brings me to a point that was maybe raised last week and just I kind of got a sense that it perked your ears up a little bit. Um, somebody mentioned maybe the Department of Energy has potential tax credits for renewable gas. Is that another avenue that you guys are willing to explore? Have yes, you it explored is. it? And is it kind of, it's not too late in the game then to go that direction and ask for more credits, correct? That is correct. We will continue to pursue that as well. Perfect. Any further questions or comments? Uh, Mayor for Demoloni. Thank you, um, Mayor Barajas. Um, Thank you, Director Worley. I do appreciate the, the background information about um, the other back and forth with the um, with the processors themselves, and you know, taking seriously their their concerns about how how absolutely massive this project is. Um, so, what I think I heard you say is there's. I was looking at the the, the background information option six. I don't. I'm not asking to ask detailed questions. No worries. Um, but overall, what what I think I heard you say was the puts and takes of even one of those options where we're scaling down certain versions of it, the offsets of what, of what the potential revenue is and other offsetting factors, um, like for example, needing to spread out over significantly more land and therefore driving up lease or purchase prices of um, for additional crop circles. Just the overall picture is we're kind of, we're kind of coming back to every other every option seems to be a, a, a negative compared to where where we're, we're starting um, or the puts and takes in balance do a, do a negative balance could you, could you help me understand what you meant by that yes uh, and your the way you described it is exactly correct the the give and take on each of the different scenarios or alternatives is exactly that if we take something away then some of the benefits we got from the current proposal goes away as well um, and for example, the option six, and you can ask me all the details you want. I think I'm pretty well versed in them. Um, they uh, wanted to look at reducing the LRADs by half and eliminating all of the nitrogen removal and then expand the land treatment system without purchase uh, in order to account to spread the load of the nitrogen from the wastewater onto the property. And what we found out through the model that uh, FCS developed is that the benefit, because of the reduced cost, which in turn reduces the credit, uh, did not turn out to be as much as we anticipated. And when you compare that small reduction compared to the additional effort of dealing with local farmers who may or may not be growing the crop that we need and will an additional 4,200 acres of crop land be enough? Or if they're not growing the right crop, then do we need to expand that to 4,500, 4,800? It depends. And so, yes, there are some savings on some, but then the trade-offs are not as great either. I appreciate that. And I and I apologize if I implied in any way you couldn't answer the oh, questions. No, no, I was no, more meaning fine. that I don't want to bore the rest of the world with okay. <laughs> with 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 getting into into the weeds in that level. Um, so I'll echo my fellow council members' uh, comments about um, about you know really appreciate how how hard you're looking into this. Um, I'll be in Olympia on Wednesday and of course part Wednesday and Thursday, and of course this is one of our top items of of how do we help defray the cost for something that um, the state seems very favorable towards. This is a good solution to help um, help improve water quality um, and also benefit industry. So, um, you know, this is a, this this was well received on our initial conversation with our legislators, um, and I hope it will continue to be very favorably received both at the state and the federal level. So, if there's anything further I can do other than continuing to follow our legislative um, agenda and, and the lobbying thereof, um, please let me know. But otherwise, um, I, I guess my my, my my last question is, are any of the processors going, this is a non-starter and it continues to be a non-starter, um, or is this really still, they're, they're looking at the cost benefit and, and running you through the technical ringer to make sure you've considered every option from, from their vantage point and their expertise? I mean, obviously the sticker shock was overwhelming. 
and um, and that's what caused us to go do all the different scenarios. And um, so it was an excellent exercise for us to be able to do it. And with their help and partnership, we're constantly trying to find a better way to do it. There is still concern, obviously, and they are interested in finally getting to a guaranteed maximum price for this whole project. And some of that's going to come <coughs> as soon as the Burnham WTA is signed because then things are solid, they can move forward, they can guarantee some things, and that will help. Other things like the cost of the phase two project, we won't know until that project goes out to bid and we get the results of the bid. That will help a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I think in the last meeting we had on Thursday, we've met for the last four weeks in a row now, and we've got another meeting next week. Um, they're seeing, I think, that of all the options we've looked at, the one that's being proposed appears to be the best option. It's just the cost is still so high. So I have uh, requested that they assist in helping go after grants at both the state and federal levels as well. And so I think some of them are going to uh, jump on that and get a hold of some of their lobbyists for their food industries and start reaching out to some of our local state and federal legislators as well because those make, those make a real big difference. And for your meeting on Wednesday, if you want to push the idea of industrial symbiosis, that was a, a, a law that was passed last year, a program that was passed that the state legislature is very in favor of. And this, this is prime project for that. And then there seems to be a big effort on carbon reduction. And this project does a great job of carbon reduction uh, based on the nitrogen removal process we are using. And it's equivalent to 8,000 acres of forest land in terms of how much carbon this project will remove out of the air. Great. Those, those two items, I think, are huge for our legislators. They certainly should be. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's all we have. Yeah. Any further questions or comments, Councilman Serrano? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Worley and maybe Mr. Ferguson, I just want to make sure and looking at the contract, the draft contract, section six is the city's obligations. And extreme, it's extremely short. It gives you two things. One, it says you're going to do what it says in a later exhibit, and you're also going to enter into agreements to do other stuff, basically is how that's written. <laughs> when I bump down to this exhibit B, <clears throat> there's a list. It's about two pages long of the city obligations. And I'll get to my point here. Exhibit D, as in Delta, then has subsection four, which is pass-through costs, which is the city will receive pass-through costs or reimbursements fundamentally for electricity, purchase natural, natural gas for heating system use, solid waste disposal, consumables, and major maintenance expenses. It appears from a quick read that that is comprehensive in our obligations. I just want to ensure, I guess from both of your standpoints, both the technical and the legal, that if there's a delta there, that we need to extend those bullet points to six, seven, or eight, or whatever the case may be. Um, obviously, we need to we need to share our costs, but where we can ensure that they're entirely offset or whatever the case may be, I think they're you know again quick read looks good. Just want to make sure we're not missing something. And I would just add that, again, this WTA is focused on the phase three, which is what Burnham is doing. So a lot of what you're reading are the same criteria that are being transferred to the city from the Burnham agreement, and we're wanting to transfer those over. There are obviously additional costs related to other phases of the project and other elements of the PWRF, and so those will all be covered by our PMC in terms of reimbursement from the processors. Okay, I appreciate that. And then I guess insofar as it sounds like we're somewhat locked in, uh, if that's the case, by transferring obligations and responsibilities and roles over, um, just let us know that. That's that's helpful up front. Uh, I appreciate that. You bet. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, Mr. Worley, thank you so much for your presentation and Sorry. always answering the questions. Sorry you had to put up with me. <laughs> We're good. Mayor, may I interrupt? Yes. Um, may I request, thank you, Mr. Worley, for that presentation, um, that we 
bump our executive session up from the end of the agenda to this portion of the meeting, and I'm happy to make a motion if that's necessary. We need a motion? We need a motion. I move to move the executive session to this point in the agenda this evening. There's a motion. Can I get a second? I'll second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Aye. Can, can we do a roll call vote? Just to make sure I'm getting everyone. <laughs> yes. Bear with me. <clears throat> All right. Council Member Brown? Yes. Compos? Yes. Mill? Yes. Roach? Yes. Serrano? No. Um, Maloney? Yes. And Barajas? Yes. So it passes six to one. Thank you. And with that, uh, we will move our executive session to the, to right now. Um, um, here we are. Um, executive session, consideration of site selection or acquisition of real estate purchase or lease if likelihood that disclosure would increase price per RCW 42.30.1101B. Item B, consideration of the minimum offering price of sale or lease of real estate if there's a likelihood that disclosure would decrease the price per RCW 42.30.1101C. And item C, uh, discussion with legal counsel about legal risk of current or proposed action per RCW 42.30.1101I. Correct? And this is for 20 minutes. Yes, uh, <clears throat> on the real estate item, the factors will be uh, site selection and uh, future use of property. Okay, so I have purchase or lease, and then I have decreased price. Is that not correct? Okay, so that too. Perfect, for 20 minutes. So it is 7.43 to return at 8.03. Thank you.
It is 8.03 and we do need to extend the executive session for another 20 minutes to return at 8.23. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. Um, we are back, officially back from our executive session. Um, we will move right on with our agenda um, as set. Uh, next item on the agenda for discussion is our uh, item C, discussion of right of way for Snake River Agriculture, LLC. We have Director White. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, this item returns to Council from the December 22 uh, hearing date, so it was set some time ago for uh, consideration on tonight's agenda. Uh, developments uh, as of late, particularly this past week and, and just today, as a matter of fact, suggest that uh, several or maybe all of the concerns of the property owner can be addressed through the administration administrative permitting process or possibly through an agreement that we could fold into a possible right-of-way vacation ordinance. Nonetheless, this item is on tonight's agenda to, and at least gives council the opportunity to provide for questions or for any clarification that might be necessary. I'll uh, check uh, closely with our city attorney, but we may need to re-advertise for a public hearing date on the vacation and uh, then we'll, uh, we may need to set the public hearing and then re-advertise as, as proper. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions of Mr. White? No, uh, I'm sorry, Director White. Seeing none, Director White, uh, thank you. And you'll be proposing a new date, correct? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, thank you for that. With no questions from council, we'll move on to our next item on the agenda, single room occupancy housing moratorium. And again, Director White. Thank you, Madam Mayor and council again. <clears throat> As noted in the agenda report, the uh, moratorium on single room occupancy housing uh, lease conversions expires on March 7th of this year. Uh, since this issue is being analyzed in our housing capacity plan, and of course, assuming council is comfortable with uh, continuing the moratorium, staff will uh, return to council with the applicable findings and a resolution for doing such. Um, and um, I did not get a chance to put this in the agenda report, but this uh, afternoon I was able to get numbers for recent conversions in all three cities for single room occupancy housing. Uh, here in Pasco, we have two projects uh, underway, one on Lewis Street and one on um, Oregon Avenue near Highway 12. They have a total of 235 SRO conversion units. In Kennewick, there is one uh, on the Columbia Center Mall footprint parcel uh, at 130 units and then one on Highway 395 that is under review and the number of units is not, was not available for uh, relaying that to council. In Richland, there is a conversion on George Washington Way and on Jadwin, and they have almost 310 units uh, available for conversion. So there's quite a handful of these occurring. Of course, Pasco is the only city that has a moratorium currently, but as suggested in the agenda report, uh, it's uh, probably prudent to continue the moratorium at least till the conclusion of the housing capacity plan. Thank you for that. Do we have any questions from council? Um, I'm sorry, I did not see who turned on your lights first, but um, hey, no, Member Tamaloni. Um, thank you, Mayor Barajas, and thank you, Director White. Um, Director White, do we have, are any of them open yet um, in any of the cities? Um, I, I believe I see right in the paper that Richland was getting close, um, but maybe I, I... I no, none, none are open. Uh, and the one, the one on um, Highway 12 in Oregon is very close. Uh, the one on Lewis Street, not so much. Uh, but my understanding in both Kennewick and Richland is none are open. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I think we we heard earlier today that the uh, from um, in regards to housing that these might be an option if for for public housing as well um, and some sort of um, option. And so I think it would be prudent to continue the moratorium until we have the housing action study, and then we can understand better if um, what options are available so they're not all you know privatized at rates that may not be actually affordable housing. Um, so certainly interested in seeing how that, that turns out. Um, and and um, 
to be clear for anybody who hasn't who, who hasn't been following this conversation uh, thoroughly, I'm not against SROs. I have some questions uh, and some concerns about them that I think that the Housing Act um, analysis that we're in the process of will will be able to answer those questions and make sure that these are 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 not displacing folks who who would otherwise need need to be using these uh, the existing stock. So that's one of the main things. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, Councilman Brown. Yeah, I concur with. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, um, but a question I would ask back to the affordable housing part of this, I would like to, not tonight, for the sake of time, maybe on your calendar, get with you and learn more about it because I have a lot of questions and how this is connected to affordable housing. So in this program, once uh, the conversion happens, how affordable is that um, to you know, to our constituents here in the city? Is it a part of the affordable housing program? Do they accept vouchers? There's a whole lot of questions, which is why, if you're open to that, I would like to be further educated on it. It's a lot of information, but how does it really help um, the affordable housing conversation? Uh, de definitely, and, and that's certainly an agreed uh, sentiment. I, I have heard um, rumors that would be stunning if I said those out loud in terms of pricing. I just can't imagine the rents being as high as I have heard. So I, I take it with a grain of salt, but I understand your sentiment, Councilman. No, I appreciate it. Even, you know, just to talk with me, what percentage of those units would maybe be affordable housing? Just the conversation would, would be good. So whenever your schedule is open, I would. If I may, it looks like there's there's one that's about to open up in Pasco that it says a thousand dollars a month. I'll send an email around so you guys can check that out. Okay. Well, there's the conversation. So when your calendar is open, again, for the education and questions, they'll be, will be on the table. But again, not for the night, for the sake of time. But I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and questions. Um, Councilman Campos. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I hate to be a dead horse, but I want to thank my previous council members for making the ask for clarification because I want to, I think that I heard tonight that it sounded like the Housing Development Authority was under the direction to not pursue these as an option. They're being told to focus on rehabilitating current properties and current programs. So uh, again, I, I would echo a point of clarification. I think it's important. Thank you. Thank you. So do you, any further uh, communication from Director White at a later time, correct? Yes, Madam Mayor, we'll bring back a, an item for Council's uh, uh, consideration. Perfect. Thank you very much. Any further questions or comments? Thank you very much, uh, Director uh, wait for your presentation and we'll move on to our next item on the ad agenda. Uh, resolution agreements for the purchase of virtual desktop infrastructure and we have uh, Director Jesse Rice. One of our favorite lately. Um, as you can see, we're sporting some new devices here. Very handy pencil. <laughs> well, that's good. I'm glad to hear those are working. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. I'm going to start with I'm uh, on the edge of losing my voice, and I'd like to blame the mayor for her visit to my office last week, but I don't have any proof of that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to make this short, uh, which will also benefit all of us as well. Uh, this, can I get a second on that? So, uh, the city currently has just over 500 traditional computers in service with another 60 plus budgeted this year. Uh, most of these devices are desktop and laptop computers, which have historically met city technology needs. But due to the ongoing growth of devices for additional staff and facilities, traditional desktop and laptops are no longer the most efficient solution, <coughs> excuse me, and are challenging to efficiently manage and support. Uh, staff has identified a modern replacement, virtual desktop infrastructure, which I'll refer to as VDI, which places computer processors, memory, and storage into a central warehouse, which users access on demand using similar devices that cost less and offer longer life cycles. Um, and just for example, this is what a virtual desktop would look like, the small form factor here. And these are used multiple places, uh, businesses, uh, federal uh, sites around the area. And then also a uh, laptop, which as you can see, looks just like a normal traditional laptop. 
Uh, but centralizing computer resources increases our manageability, allowing for rapid deployment of new users and devices, installation of software, and updating security services. Uh, some additional improvements include flexibility to assign resources by need, so not one size fits all. We assign resources as needed by the user. Uh, mobility connect from any internet connection, redundancy and disaster recovery options, uh, while still providing the same desktop user experience regardless of device or location. Uh, cost of implementation of VDI is just under 897000 which is included in the 2023 city budget. Uh, this cost includes the warehouse data and software infrastructure, 127 virtual desktop or laptop devices, and additional licenses to support the ongoing conversion of existing devices or new computers. Uh, so staff is requesting the approval to proceed with a purchase from CompuNet Inc., who is a current city technology vendor using cooperative purchase agreements, which the city is members of and are attached to this resolution. And with that, I ask, do you have any questions? Thank you, Director Rice. I apologize. Typo Mary got you. <laughs> yeah, it may not have been you, but if it didn't go well, it was you. So it was up. <laughs> Any questions from our council members? Councilman Campos. Madam Mayor, I believe Councilman Milney had his light on before I did. Maloney. 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 I'm sorry. Mayor Virginia Maloney. Um two two questions. Um I think you said that this is within the approved budget. Is that a true statement? Yes, it is two line items. Uh, we have a specific line item to purchase infrastructure, uh, hardware and software. And then we also have our traditional replacement computer fund and the new computer budget, which we convert into virtual desktop funding. And since they are okay. less than the cost of those, that kind of offsets the overall cost. Understood. Thank you. Um, and then the other question I had is, um, I've been through a conversion towards um, virtual desktops in the past. Mm -hmm. um, oh, um, and what we found was there was a number of users that needed to not use virtual desktops for a variety of reasons, applications primarily. Yeah. Um, about what percentage of staff do you expect to retain um, traditional um, desktops or laptops? I would. I, I don't have a percentage for sure, but we have identified certain certain uh, devices, certain users, and also the need to have certain redundancy around the city to ensure that if something would happen, no internet connection, something happened to the warehouse that we can continue to run. Um, but I would say probably 15 to 20 percent is where we're looking at for laptops for sure, and maybe about 10 percent of the desktop computers. Okay. I think that sounds about where we ended up, um, but it was a big push and then a slow pull back so i appreciate that you already think about that thank you that's all, all right. i have thank you councilman campos very brief i have no questions i just want to congratulate you on your appointment as director oh thank you very much i appreciate that congratulations all right thank you any further questions or comments thank you so much director uh rice for a very informative presentation thank appreciate you appreciate it with that, we will move on to our next item on the agenda, presentation for land mobile radio to cellular radio interface infrastructure. Uh, Chief Gear. Madam Mayor and Council, thank you. Um, and I raised my hand on who probably couldn't run a virtual desktop. I don't know if you noticed that, but I don't, I don't know where I'd stack all the stuff on my desk if it was virtual. Um, so <laughs> uh, with that, uh, actually, uh, Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Pat Reed is going to uh, give you a rundown in conjunction with uh, Brad Steiner from AT&T FirstNet on a project we've been working on since the announcement of Amazon and the actual size of those buildings and concerns we've had with those. And, and uh, it, it's, again, one of those that's kind of over my head. Uh, I usually just listen in on the meetings. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Deputy Chief Reed and, and uh, Brad Steiner, who's virtual. Thank Good you. evening, Council. Good evening. Thank you. Um, part of this project, we have a request in, which also we have uh, 400 and almost $10,000 in the budget with that we're going to ask to execute as a part of this project that was budgeted for the 23-24 budget. Um, as you can see, currently the fire department uses what we call traditional land mobile radios, as does the police. And what they are is they're just basic um, frequencies that we transmit over. They're assigned to us by the FCC. And, they have limitations with that. What we're moving towards is a platform that will incorporate cellular, hence land mobile radio to cellular LTE, long-term evolution. Um, what they do is our current radios by design work very well in the urban interface. What I mean by that, as long as we're in a structure that's made of wood or not metal, a lot of metal or concrete, they work very well. 
they work outside great because they, they have direct line of sight and so on like that. The radio system has limitations when used in emergencies occurring in such large buildings as the new Amazon buildings we have, some of the processing plants we have, um, the hospitals, an example, and all of our schools were running into these issues with that. So hence, we've been out looking at ways to improve our communications, and that is um, we've partnered up with FirstNet, um, AT&T FirstNet, which is also approved by the federal government for communications, Band 14 communications, cellular that will be around in the event of a natural or man-made disaster. Um, with that being said, what I'd like to do is um, tell you a little bit, to overcome the limitations we, with our land mobile system, we're requesting council's approval to augment the system with integrated long-term evolution, cellular communications. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Brad Steiner. Brad is the uh, project engineer that's actually started working with us on this project almost two years ago, once Amazon, like Chief said, come into play. We looked at Amazon initially, but we've also gone further, and what we've done is looked holistically where we have problems within the city with our communications. Keep in mind, as we take and spearhead this out, it will eventually help PD as well in, in this system. So we're looking at that as well. And there's some other benefits to it with our partners around the area. So Brad, if you're there, you can go ahead and pick up. Thank you. This is the first test of the audio. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you good. There we go. It's always a test the first time around. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and Council. I appreciate the opportunity to brief you, and, and we will try and keep it brief. I really want to point out, uh, in addition to the comments that Deputy Chief Reed made about what the gains are, and most importantly, gains and not losses. You know, the most important thing here is that your fire has a set of tools that they rely on every day in that land mobile radio system, and we're really here to augment it. And so, Forgive me that I can't quite see the slides, but what I'm assuming is you're looking at one that says additional needs for communications platform and system. Thank you. And there's there's five main items that I that I think are really important for this project, and they're highlighted here. Grow radio connectivity. So as Deputy Chief Reed said, you have good communications with your land mobile radio system today. However, when we get into new buildings such as Amazon or even frankly some existing commercial buildings, the LMR systems aren't traditionally designed to that and to get into those places. And frankly, that's a lot of where the cellular technology either exists because we've installed in building systems there or just by the very nature of the technology. So really getting you that uh, enhanced in building performance but it's also growing outside and, you know, the fire department will be able to take advantage of this technology anywhere there is a viable cellular connection. So when we start to go outside the city, outside the county or even other places. So it's not a matter of just getting one solution, you know, by immediately coming on that's radio connectivity all over the place. Second, and I really highlight retain, and this isn't something that, you know, cellular people normally like to talk about in terms of land mobile radio products, but it's really important, you know, the devices that your department uses, they're rugged, they're designed for the missions that they go into. And so this solution not only allows them to continue to use their existing land mobile radio investment, but it basically embeds a platform into that device that receives the second highest priority on our network. The only thing higher priority than their push to talk traffic is the federally mandated 911 calls. So they will be above all commercial users. They will be above everything else. That's embedded into their radios, but also as further options go out, you know, a question was asked earlier about where technology can be used. You know, this also opens the door to other devices should the mission not call for that mission critical or, you know, the LMR radio, but smartphones, tablets, and other devices. Third, this adds location capabilities. So right now, the ability to track devices and apparatus in the field isn't inherent to the radio system. It is inherent to these products. And when we embed into the radios, it will also be able to report GPS location as well. So vehicles in route and personnel even as well in the future. So the data is there. Now what do we do? Perhaps Fourth bullet, like which is important is I'm sorry. Brad, let me question? just inject for council. Council, if you remember, two years ago, you approved us to purchase some new radios. Those radios were bought with the technology advancements that we're looking to incorporate into this. So we've already 
prepaid two years down the road for the technology that we're talking about going, part of the technology we're talking about going to. Brad, I'm sorry, go ahead. No worries. So fourth bullet, and this is important, is whenever we're introducing a new technology, we have to keep dispatch in mind. We can't introduce new technology and new procedures. You know, there's a lot of training that goes along with it. So this solution brings new functionality to the dispatch center, but also keeps all of their controls similar to what they're used to today. And then finally, as the, as the chief mentioned, interoperability with law and fire. So this has a, this technology connects right to the existing radio systems, both the conventional fire and ultimately the 800 megahertz system that law uses, and will now allow fire on LTE to be interacting with law agencies as well, again, all under dispatch control. So if we move to the next slide. So really, this is a consortium of a solution. This is L3 Harris, as the chief mentioned, the radio provider, FirstNet, myself as the network uh, provider, as well as alternate devices and Catalyst. And this partnership together has been, as the chief mentioned, has been working together for over a year to make sure that all of our products and solutions are coming together in the right place and that we've delivered a design <laughs> and a solution that can be implemented quickly uh, by, the, by the fire department. Next slide, please. And just in terms of the deployment plan, just to keep it simple, you know, we're basically looking to move ahead to the next phase, which is order, and then we'll start to install. There's three components that come to this, as I mentioned earlier, the catalyst system, our push to talk application on other smart devices, and of course the mission critical software going into the radios. So we can, in, we can build this system, we can integrate it into the existing BCES system and validation testing. So, you know, step by step by step, we're going to make sure that this technology is introduced hand in hand with training and operations so that when cutover comes, everyone's ready. And, you know, uh, your existing dispatchers of the at BCES were definitely sensitive to their workload. So while the technology is coming to deliver that location, you know, we aren't introducing it immediately. So as they move to their future plans and migrations, they can uh, use this information provided by the Catalyst Council to provide location to them. So hopefully furthering and enabling their work for years to come. And then with that, we can move on to the next slide. Council, if you have any, any questions, questions for us. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, do we have any questions or comments from council? Looks like there's no questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. I do appreciate that the Correct me if I'm wrong. The equipment was prepaid or pre-purchased? So, no. Let me clarify. So, we bought our portable radios and some of our mobile radios two years ago with the intent of upgrading them. And now what we're doing is the equipment we need to integrate the um, cellular or the LTE with the dispatch center to take our LMR to uh, um, cellular. We've budget it in the uh, 23 budget for that and what we're asking now is to be able to execute that money with council's approval okay thank you looks like there's no other questions thank you very much thank you appreciate council you. appreciate it with that we will move on to our next item on the agenda which is we're almost there i swear we're almost there uh item six miscellaneous council discussion uh interim city manager uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, actually, Mr. Worley's got one quick one for you. It's nice to turn it over to him instead of Maria, right? Director Worley. Good evening again. I just wanted to invite Council to an event that we are planning for Saturday, the 18th. And this is a, a Road 76 overpass fundraising event. And as Council may know, uh, the Road 76 overpass is a project that's been on our TIP and one of the areas that highlighted the need for this was the Broadmoor Interchange Access Revision Report when all the traffic modeling was done for that project. It really highlighted the benefit of the Road 76 overpass project. So uh, we have uh, a public outreach uh, event happening. We are going to have folks uh, meet at either side of the freeway at road 76 either on the north side or the south side and then we're going to have some uh, drone photos taken showing 
oh my gosh, we can't get across this thing. <laughs> There's something in the way called a freeway. And so uh, it's part of the public involvement process that we are doing in an effort to uh, strengthen our federal raise application for grant money for this project. So we just wanted to invite you and encourage as many people as possible to come out and join us. Director Willie, I can't help but picture Frogger. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, this sounds very interesting. And so there's an invite to the community to come and help raise some funds. Any further questions or comments? Miscellaneous comments? We'll move on to our next item on the agenda is actually, there's nothing else. We've completed the executive session. I like that, bringing up the executive session up a little bit. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And it is 8.50, this meeting is adjourned.